Thank you. Uh, so I wish I were in Tokyo. Um, I would be would be great to be able to uh, be there and chat with people, but uh, unfortunately, that's uh, not the way it is. And but thanks to the wonders of modern technology, I can be there virtually. So uh, great to be here. So uh, this, uh, oops, I need to, there we go. So I'm gonna talk about threaded code and how that relates to uh, native code in the, uh, the system that I'm building. So threaded code is an alternative execution model uh, dating from the 1970s. I was first uh, aware of it um, in a Fortran compiler that uh, ran on the PDP 11 back in the 1970s, and uh, also was used by fourth um, and still is used by fourth as far as I know. So it's an intermediate point between a bytecode interpreter and native execution, um, both in terms of space and performance. So it's larger than a bytecode, uh, but smaller than native execution, and it's usually faster than bytecode and um, slower than native execution. The advantage, or one of the advantages besides being an intermediate point is that it's much easier to generate um, uh, code for it because it's essentially a virtual machine that we're generating code for. And one of my goals is that I want to be able to have native code um, and threaded code and be able to transfer seamlessly between them, transition seamlessly between them. So, um, just a tiny bit of background. This is for a small talk system that I'm building called Zag. Uh, this is a from scratch implementation um, and the runtime is implemented in a, a systems language called Zig, which is relatively new, but a very interesting language. And my goal is to support um, open existing open small talk systems. So um, Squeak, Faro, Quiz are all um, small talk systems that run on open small talk. And so I'm aiming to use those systems because I certainly don't want to rewrite um, user land uh, for small talk because that's that's a huge effort. Um, assumptions, uh, large memory, 64-bit, uh, triple E floating point, uh, multi-core and threading. This threading, of course, not the threaded execution that I'm referring to, but uh, multiple cores and fast execution. So those are the goals that I'm aiming for. So what I'm going to talk about, there's there's lots of interesting things about this um, runtime that I'm building. Uh, I just noticed I have a typo. Uh, lots of interesting things, but um, what I'm going to talk about today is the transition between threaded and native code. And there are three key components um, to, that make this work. Uh, the way the stack's organized, uh, the way methods are laid out, and the way contexts are handled. I'll, I realize that many of you probably are not super familiar with Smalltalk, so I will uh, explain the details um, as I come up. So uh, the stack is um, a separate stack, a uh, separate value stack that is used for the, um, the runtime environment. And all the values on the stack and the heap are tagged objects. Um, and there are no reference objects on the hardware stack. This means that garbage collection is a lot simpler because with the with a stack and a heap, then everything that needs to be handled in terms of garbage collection is available. It also means it's very easy to interoperate between modes because we don't have to dig through a hardware stack trying to find um, references to things. We don't have to worry about um, native code holding on to references between um, between execution, everything has to be uh, maintained on the stack or the heap, or between execution of native code, everything has to be maintained. So that, that just simplifies things um, significantly to have this non, the stack that is not interwoven uh, through the hardware stack. And as you'll see, I have some uh, very trivial benchmark at the end. Um, you'll see that there is some cost of doing this, um, but it's not huge. Um, the next is methods. So methods or functions, depending upon how you want to think about them, but um, methods have other fields, but what we're interested in today is just the, um, the transition between um, runtime or between uh, threaded code and uh, native code. 
And for that, really only two fields matter. And one is the selector, and this is used by, because this is a small talk system, we need to be able to verify that um, the method that we're executing is the one that was expected to be executed. Um, otherwise we'll raise a does not understand message. So that's what that's used for. And then there's the code array. Now, the code array is a sequence of, of uh, references to, um, to functions that are either JIT functions or native code functions that implement uh, a series of operations. And um, the first word of this code array determines how the execution will proceed. So I'm gonna show you examples of um, a thread of code uh, a bit later, but for now, um, just, sorry, I'm wrestling with Zoom a little bit here. Um, okay, anyway. Um, so the first word determines how execution proceeds. So the first possibility is that it is uh, something to verify the selector. And this would verify the dispatch was to the correct method and otherwise it's, it's not really a no-op. Um, but this could be replaced with something that did something else like triggering a, a JIT. And that would be the start of a completely threaded method uh, would be that it would start with this verify selector. If it's a JITed method, then that first word will have a reference to the native code that does the same uh, thing as the, um, as the threaded code would do. And as it executes, it passes control to the next threaded block, next threaded code using telecalls. So the native stack doesn't really move um, as we transition through the threaded code. And as well as passing control with a tail call, it also maintains the correct pointer into the code array. And we'll see that in, in the code examples that I have a bit later. We also might have handwritten native code, uh, which will have a code array the same as uh, the other two cases, but the code array in that case will just have the, the code components, um, which are also linked with tail calls and they maintain the correct pointer. One of the interesting things about this is you could also have, um, you could use an interpreter as well. So you could have byte coded methods. And so that first word in that case would point to the interpreter, which would um, then interpret the code that follows. So in some sense, this is just indirection. So you could get this, you might say, by um, just having an indirect word that sent you off to native code or to um, a threaded code execution or to an interpreter. But the nice thing about this is that it's it's built into the model. So yes, for native code, it is an indirection, but for everything else, it's just part of the way it works. And so it works really, um, it's a very seamless interaction. Oops. Um, then we have the context and the context in small talk terms is the, the stack frame. And um, the context is only is created lazily. So only if a method will send a message to another um, method, will it will the context even be created? And if it is created, it's created on the stack. But it, we don't even fill in all the details of the context um, when we start because we only need those things if this migrates to the heap. So as long as it stays on the stack, we'll leave some of the fields um, empty. So the only two that fields that really matter here, obviously there's a link to the previous context and uh, local variables and, and things like that. But the two pieces that really matter here are the threaded um, program counter and the native program counter. So the native program counter is a pointer to uh, a block of code that will execute. And the threaded pr program counter is a pointer to the, um, the code array in, that is in the method. So when it starts execution, the first word is executed indirectly and goes off and ex starts executing. And the pointer to the following word is passed um, through. So um, when we're looking at the context, the context is for return purposes. So we're executing in some method and we want to return um, to the, the caller. And so the caller could have been uh, 
could have been threaded code or it could have been native code or it could have been an interpreter. If it was a call from threaded code, then the, the native program counter will contain the uh, address of the word to be executed. So in other words, the, the next block in the CPS, um, uh, sorry, the next uh, threaded ex, uh, block. So it's actually the code itself, not a pointer, to, not a reference to the indirect uh, reference. So it will be actually the code we're going to execute when we return. So the native program counter is by default is where we're just going to return to. That's all we do. And the uh, threaded program counter will point just past the address of that uh, word. In a call from CPS code, the NPC will contain the address of the continuation CPS code, and the TPC will point just past that address. If it was handwritten, it does the, basically the same thing, um, except that word, the previous word, will actually be a pointer to the CPS block. So if we want to return in fast mode, we simply use the NPC. We just take the NPC and we execute that as the next uh, code. We call it, um, well, actually we do, we do a, a tail call uh, return to it and uh, then execute it in that location. But if we want to return in thread mode, so we're executing perhaps and, and we get some error we want to debug, so we want to go back to threaded mode where we can do step-by-step uh, -step execution. Then what we do is we use the threaded code referenced by the, uh, the word before the TPC. Uh, details are not critical here, but basically we forget about where the native program counter is pointing to and we go to what the threaded block says. Um, if that threaded block was handwritten, it'll actually do the right thing as well. So it, it's all very clean. So I'm gonna look, look quickly at an example. And unfortunately I did not start my timer. So I don't know how much time, more time I have left. So perhaps if somebody could say in the chat, I would appreciate it. Um, so this is just a, a trivial Fibonacci function. Uh, check itself is less than two. If, we're, if true, then we execute the block that says return one. Otherwise um, return self minus one Fibonacci plus self minus two Fibonacci. Okay, very straightforward. Thanks, Stefan. Um, so here is what the threaded code would look like for that. And uh, the only thing I need to say about the compilation is that my compiler inlines code uh, very aggressively. So this code was, is inlined from the, the, uh, the return block here gets inlined uh, into the code here. So um, this is a label. Uh, so we have a verify selector, verify that's the proper method. Then we have the Fibonacci. We take the self, uh, duplicate it so we can compare it with two. If it's false, we branch down here. If it, and otherwise we pop the value, push a one on the result and return. Otherwise we branch down here, then we create a context, uh, push the, the self value, push the literal one, subtract, call Fibonacci. This call is actually going to branch back to here. So it, it um, doesn't have to do a full dispatch. And again, that's just an optimization from the compiler. Then, um, so this call is going to update the context that we created here appropriately so that uh, when we return, we'll come back to here, push two, uh, push self on, subtract two call Fibonacci again, again, updating the context. So it will return to here. We add the value and return the top. Okay, so, so this is the translation to continuation passing style. So this is what the, um, the JIT would do. And this is pretty intimidating. I recognize that. So I'll, I'll go through it very quickly and uh, somewhat blithely. This first part from uh, line one to eight, is just the verify selector part. So it's basically checking to see that the, so this is the signature, the type signature of all of the, um, all of the blocks. So the code array is a, an array of pointers to functions with this type signature. So we pass the next um, uh, threaded program counter. So the pointer into the code array, 
We pass the stack, we pass the heap pointer, we pass a thread, we pass the context pointer, the current one, and we pass initially the selector hash so we can determine whether this selector is the one we expected. So this just checks that and if it's okay, then it does a tail call to fibcomp0, which is here, passing an updated program counter. So we advance to the next thread, pass the stack and the and heap pointer, and, and all the other fields don't change. So the only field that changes in this case is the program counter, and we pass this. So these all end up being in registers. So this becomes just add one, two, or eight, or whatever to the uh, a threaded program counter and then branch to fibcomp0, which in this case may even be optimized away. Then fibcomp0 has the same type signature, everything does, but we don't care about the selector hash anymore. That was only used in the first place. So we do the, the checks. So these, this code corresponds to um, this code here. So from three to 10 is uh, corresponds to this code. And here we're going to create a so um, do the so we check to see if it's less than two and we do whatever. Otherwise, we create a context. So here's where we create the context. Um, and creating a context may invoke a garbage collection. So the uh, stack pointer may get updated. So we have to pull the the heap pointer and the stack pointer out of out of this. Um, all is simple, straightforward. And then we're going to uh, subtract one from, from self, uh, store that on the stack. Um, and here's, we're storing in the, the threaded program counter PC plus 18. So we entered with uh, the PC pointing to this, uh, this push literal instruction, one past the dupe. And now we're going to, we need to return with it pointing just after this. So that's why we add 18 to it. It's the number of uh, words here. The native program counter we set to fibcomp1, which is on the next page, and I'll show you in a second. Um, and then we set, uh, because we're calling back to this function, we point back to fibcomp t, and we're gonna call it with the pointer to, so we're gonna call fibcomp zero, and we're gonna pass in the address of line five here. So that's why it's fib plus two. Okay, this is fibcomp one, uh, which just takes the result from it having been um, of the Fibonacci of uh, self minus one. And um, again, we do a call. So this time we set the threaded program counter to PC plus six because we're we're passed in with it pointing here, and we want it to point to here when we return, and so on. Okay, and then this is the return. So here we're doing a return. We pull the um, the caller context from the result, and then we call its uh, native program counter, passing in its uh, threaded program counter and the and the rest of the variable uh, parameters that we need. Uh, this is just the same thing, except if it was handwritten, instead of it having this long um, block, it would just have this very short one, which just has the addresses of the various uh, threaded CPS components. Okay, and now when we pass in TPC, we pass in TPC of PC plus one, because we're just jumping along to the next one in, in the row. Okay, uh, just... This is the, the native version in Zig. Um, and this is the same version except using the full objects. So it, it receives an object and returns an object, and does all the uh, calculations using the built-in um, primitives. So uh, ran a simple, a simple benchmark. Um, here are the, the results. Uh, this is all highly tentative. Uh, this is hand compiled and so on at this point. But these are uh, the sparrow, the sparrow line. Uh, these last two are kind of uh, specious, so I wouldn't worry about those. These are the two significant ones. So this is using the Open Smalltalk uh, JIT 
and this is the uh, performance they get. The fastest version using native integers and so on is this. This is fib object is kind of the best that I could possibly do. So because this is doing all the um, the arithmetic using full objects, um, but using the native stack. This is uh, the the jitted or sorry the hand jitted um, code the hand compiled code. So this is about what I would expect. Um, this is going to produce as ex execution time, which isn't too bad. It's um, you know uh, on the M1, it's relative, you know, it's almost twice as slow, or it's twice as slow on the X86, it's uh, not too much worse. And then the threaded version um, is about four to five times, um, you know, three to four times slower, um, but that's not. And then this is just a, a very simple uh, bytecode interpreter, which I just ran for, uh, for fun. Okay. Um, and that's, I maybe rushed through it a little bit faster than I had to, but uh, that's um, a talk. So this is moving towards a high performance small talk that will run on multi-core systems and use all the cores and so on. I'm hopeful that some of the ideas may make their way to other small talks. And uh, I'd like to support other languages in this interpreter for this runtime. So I'm open to questions. Thank you, Dave.